Warning, I am about to fuck up so many French names and words in this video, I apologize in advance. If we critique it for what it is compositionally, one can pinpoint so many things wrong inside French electronic musician Mr. Wazo's third studio album, Lamb's Anger. Let me tell you why this is my favorite album of all time. One, two, three. Quentin Depew, also known as Mr. Wazo, is a jack of all trades, to put it simply. A French electronic musician, DJ, and film director, Quentin has a diverse thirst for creation, known in the music world for his raw, brutally infectious production that swings like a pendulum between analog instrumentation and computer-esque sounds. And on the other side of this scale, the Paris native is also known for his surreal and satirical direction with how he directs and presents his films in the world of cinema, creating movies such as the comedy Wrong Cops and the outrageous horror film Rubber about a tire that comes to life and kills people. Today, we are obviously going to be focusing on his musical career, the side of his craft he solely uses the Mr. Wazo name for, and more specifically, taking a look at his 2008 release on Ed Banger Records titled Lamb's Anger. To say that this album has mixed reviews is an understatement. There are people who love this thing, Mr. Wazo fans that just, it's their favorite thing ever, and there are others and not so much, but, but why so? The interesting thing about these differing feelings, as you'll soon discover in this video, is that many of the reasons people seem to dislike this album are the same reasons why many Wazo fans find it so appealing. And as someone who can truly say that this is my favorite album of all time, I definitely have quite an emotional attachment to this album. I've truly been listening to it quite frequently for years now, and find it kind of funny discussing what some don't like about this album, because like I just said, what they don't find attractive about it is what I usually adore about it. In this video, I'm going to tell the story of Mr. Wazo, break down Lamb's anger in every single individual song within it. I really want to take some punches at it, explore what makes it all such a varying jumble of sounds that one can easily love or find understandably unappetizing. My attempt at presenting the case for the good and the bad about Lamb's anger. Folks, get cozy, because we are about to explore the brilliance of Mr. Wazo's Lamb's Anger, my favorite album of all time. And real quick, if this is your first time here on the channel, please make sure to hit that subscribe button, turn all notifications on so you never miss a future video. I cannot wait to have you back for the next one. Quentin Depew, or Mr. Wazo, was born on April 15th, 1974 in Paris, France. By the early 90s, he had found a love for photography and music, obtaining a camera and his first ever synthesizer. The stars would soon align for Mr. Wazo a couple years later when record label owner Laurent Garnier, Garnier? Not really sure? Bought a car from Mr. Wazo's father. Garnier, owner of the label FCOM, quickly found out about Depew's talents and let him direct the music video for his very own songs. Eventually, Depew was signed to FCOM, on which he released his first EP simply titled Number One. And since then, Mr. Wazo has gone on to produce a wide variety of tracks, remixes, albums, projects. Headbanging Simplicity on 1999's Flat Beat was Mr. Wazo's first real breakthrough song in the music world, having his track played in six different Levi ads along with the debut of Wazo's right-hand man, the one, the only, Flat Eric, a cute and cuddly character you'll find in most of Wazo's music videos jamming along to them sweet, sweet beats. And before we continue any further, I'm not going to be playing any of these songs in the background of this video. Usually I get a ton of shit that I don't play the songs that I'm talking about, but I'll get like hit on YouTube, you know, for doing that. So I'm just going to link, you know, Lamb's Anger and everything else in the description of this video. So if you do want to hear them, um, just head on down below. So just when Mr. Wazo was scratching into the mainstream music world with this flat beat track, Wazo threw a curveball and released Analog Worms Attack in the very same year, an experimental album that revealed a much more daring side of his craft. As Emerged Agency states best, this record scared away most of Flat Beat's fans, but seduced another, more specialist audience. So this was the world's first look at Wazo's now commonly known ever-changing production style, you never know what you're gonna get with this motherfucker. For those who have listened to his discography, we have seen a ton of styles in his releases ever since his beginnings, but there are three main factors, three main things, events, I don't even really know what to call it, 
that I believe truly influenced the development of Mr. Wazo's ambitions for Lamb's Anger ever since his first appearance in the music world in the 90s. First is Analog Worm's Attack. Like I said, dropping that album so close to the success of Flatbeat was pretty abrupt to say the least. This hard shift from a more simple, lo-fi, dancey beat that people seem to love and want more of, and him saying, nope, fuck you, say hello to Analog Worm's Attack, baby. This power and confidence to release weird, wacky sounds, something different, despite whatever success or fan growth his most recent release may provide him with, which lasts as a staple with Wazo pretty much to this very day. The next major event and influence on the path to shaping Lamb's anger was in 2004 when he stumbled upon a new obsession with computers and computer-based sounds. We saw him release his second album, Mustache. Mustache was created exclusively using computers, voiding any use of analog equipment that he would frequent in the past. Since then, Wazo has jumped all over the place, from analog equipment to computer-based equipment, throwing everything but the kitchen sink and songs from harsh and erratic beeps and boops that that's what i like to call them you know a bunch of little like beeps and boops beepy boop noises jolting synths and eventually the fun and funky use of sample chops to really saute a complete meal for your ears to digest and that my friends is what leads us into what i believe is the third most important event in shaping his style for lamb's anger his inclusion in the legendary ed banger label in where in 2007 he released the transsexual ep featuring the ever so funky rework and sampling of the disco track Do It At The Disco by Gary's Gang on the song Patrick 122. If y'all like horns, this thing has the most out of nowhere saxophone drop halfway through the song. Give it a listen, you're welcome. And finally folks, after these three major establishments, 1999 showing that Wazo will not give a fuck, 2004 showing his new love for using computers, and 2007 a real funky sample chopping technique, we arrive at our destination for today's video in the first place, 2008, the release of Lamb's Anger. This trifecta of attitudes and passions all crashing into one another, creating this deformed, 17-track long, jagged edge, problematic collection of music that if it had a face, would probably be covered in dry skin begging for a moisturizer, sucking on a toothpick to the point where it's mushy, and using way too much hair product for something as simple as a little flip above your forehead. This thing is ugly. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, my friend, and I personally find it to be the most beautiful and mesmerizing piece of music I've ever heard in my time here on planet Earth. If Daft Punk are the godfathers of both the original filtered French touch sound and the recent Paris-centric maximalist bloghouse scene, then Quentin Depew, aka the elusive Mr. Wazo, is their drunk, wife-beating, libidinous uncle. You can never tell in what state he is going to show up at the family reunion, and you're not sure you would want to be seen in public with him, but you know the party would definitely not be the same without him. Lamb's Anger, released on Ed Banger Records on November 17th, 2008, is Mr. Wazo's third studio album. 17 tracks clocking in at 44 minutes and 32 seconds. There's also an unfinished iTunes bonus track called Lamb's Garbage as well. The album art is a play on a scene from the 1929 silent surrealist drama fantasy film titled Un Kien Andalou, or in English, An Andalusian Dog. There's one point in the beginning of the film where a razor is being held up to the eye of a woman as she stares calmly ahead. It's all very weird, I once watched the whole thing, and of course with this film being silent and super old, it makes it all feel like a nightmare best not had. On the Lamb's Anger artwork, this screenshot from the film is reimagined with our favorite little friend Flat Eric, and the film's surreal and twitchy jump cut nature correlates perfectly with the tantrum Wazo is about to create musically for us on Lamb's Anger. It is a 10 out of 10 artwork wise for me. The relationship between the nature of the art and the music itself is just fantastic, and I love it. I love it so much. And musically, like the Un Kien Andalun film, this album is all over the place. There are songs that are completely different, even when paired right next to one another on the track list. Track 7 going into track 8 is the probably the most prominent example of this. And at the same time, there are also songs that are almost exactly the same, literally recycled from one another, like Poor Richard 2 and Poor Richard 7, as well as the tracks Z and W. This album has no identity at all. It, it is so unknowing of what it wants to be that because of that, it has such a distinct personality. And whether that's undomesticated, pretentious, and outright random on Wazo's end, or just fun as fuck, it's something you're really gonna have to decide for yourself when you give this thing the listen 
Um, and, and that split decision alone is the starting point for the fine line between fans of this album and those who find it to be, simply put, annoying. And Wazo warns us of what's to come on the album all the way in the very beginning with the first track, Hun, with this human yet robot-like narration that reads, Bonjour, this is me again, Mr. Wazo. You are about to hear a collection of some recorded stuff. Some are good, some are bad, some are just okay. Turn off the light, read a book, you are ready. After this point, from start to finish, Wazo grabs you by the legs, okay, and flops you over his head back and forth, back and forth like something from an old black and white Disney cartoon. Track number two, Porriture 2, sounds like a grandfather clock that came alive. This eerie flute and piano combo reminiscent of a, of a state of sleepwalking where you can't remember if what you saw was real or imagination due to your lethargic senses. And right after that, we go into the third track of the album, simply titled Z, which begins as if it's crumbling to its demise and then slowly builds its way back up with the same thumping synth and simple pumpy kick and snare beat. If Porriture 2 is a grandfather clock dancing in the wee hours of the night, this track Z is like a dance-craved, coked-out, daddy-long-legged spider trotting its way along to the beat. There are so many sharp, individual sounds on this track that gradually build their way up to the drop towards the end of the song. I can't help but visualize the eight legs of a skinny-legged spider bouncing up and down to that kick-snare beat. I, I can't really explain it. It, it, it. This song is just another song, you gotta listen to it for yourself, and I think you're gonna get what I'm saying. <laughs> and then, right after this, the fourth track on this album may be one of my favorite songs, like ever created ever it, it is definitely the funkiest song i've ever heard in my life and it's it's so simple I'm like I, okay track four it's called cut dick that is the name of this song cut dick it is absolutely amazing once again that classic ed banger kick snare that evolves and gets more powerful throughout the song paired with this incredible guitar synth thing and bass ensemble that plays the same notes together in harmony I just can't. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. So far on Lamb's Anger, we got a dancing grandfather clock, a playful si spider. This song, this song right here, Cut Dick, is a chicken in a bubble bath with a top hat and a saxophone. Oh yeah, I forgot. There's this saxophone that comes in two out of nowhere in the song. It is truly one of the most unique, exciting, yet crushingly simple songs I've ever heard and might be my favorite track on this album. But I digress though, because every time I listen to Lamb's Anger straight through, I start saying, well, shit, maybe this song is my favorite on the album, so let's keep going, let's keep going. The next track is called Two Takes It, featuring Carmen Castro, and this is where I believe the album first shows a sign of weakness, and where I even can say, eh, I don't know if I dig this. It's a weird pairing of two different samples that may sound a little weird in a quirky, clever way, but ultimately it just seems off to me, that's the best way I can put it, and it's all topped with this monotone rap delivery that I feel could have been more fun with a better flow. And while the last track, Cut Dick, is so fundamentally simple, it doesn't feel empty, and this Two Takes It track, it just feels vacant to me. I don't know, it's just something, something's just missing, and I wish Wazo figured that out for us. I do love the eventual chorus that comes about in the song that adds an extra note or something to the recipe to create some separation from the previous chorus, but all in all, I think it's a throwaway track on here. I do like the horns, though. They're kind of tight. The next track, Rank, which is pretty much an interlude track featuring what sounds like some 8-bit video game machine gun sounds into this morphing melody of eerie, Frankenstein-esque flavor. It's whatever. It's an interlude. But this leads into track 7 and track 8, which I said before are two totally wildly different tracks with absolutely nothing in between them. And yeah, while all albums have songs that are different obviously from one another, these two seem like they shouldn't be on the same album at all. Track 7, Bruce Willis is Dead, is this mind-numbing repetition of someone saying Bruce Willis is dead, on top of a vocal sample from the undisputed truth that Wazo turns into this shrieking, blaring, almost siren sound underneath everything. So it's that, right? That's the intro of the song, and then everything cuts for one final Bruce Willis is dead, and then this song becomes this buzzing, rave-stomping banger with this massive drop It'll have steam come pouring out of your headphones. I love it though. It's so out of nowhere, and to this day, I still get this hearing it for the first time joy of sorts when it comes on, and it, it really pumps me up. I think it's a great song. This is a good example of a song on Lamb's Anger that showcases one of the reasons many critics dislike this album, in my opinion. Mr. Wazo is so unpredictable that he eventually becomes predictably unpredictable, relying on shock factor and slaps to the face to woo you 
into continuing this musical date with him. Overblown and frantic, with a surplus of sounds and dearth of ideas, Lamb's anger too often falls back on cliché and a shrieking, nerve-shredding register. And this is something I can agree is present. He is predictably unpredictable on Lamb's Anger, purposely building no bridges between songs and even inside the songs themselves almost all the time. But that's exactly why I love this album so much, always being on your toes despite the fact that you can almost smell a sudden change up right around the corner. You know when he's sticking around with something in one minute, the next you'll be saying, oh, there's that Mr. Wazo again. You know, good old Mr. Wazo. I love it though. Lamb's anger is angsty and it cries wolf constantly, and the squeaky wheel always gets the grease, am I right? It's as if this album has over 30 songs because each song really has multiple parts. It's a clunky masterpiece in my eyes. And after Bruce Willis is dead, we completely change climates in predictably unpredictable fashion as we head into the eighth track on the album titled Joe, which is just this breezy, airy, lighthearted, groovy summertime car cruising tune with this tick in the background that you ask yourself, shouldn't this tick, this ticking sound, be annoying me? Yet it all comes together so uniquely well, it's, it's impossible for this track to not put you in a positive mood. But don't get too comfy, my friend, listen, cause that woozy, easygoing vibe is ripped off like a band-aid. Someone promises they'll pull at the end of a 1-2-3 count, rips it off prematurely at 2. Next up is the track Positive. Another one of my all-time favorite Mr. Wazo songs that is just another brutally wicked, loud, wide, and larger-than-life dance track with these zapping, laser beam I feel like when I pair the tracks on Mr. Wazo's Lamb's Anger with Animals, it helps get my point across more clearly. So this, this track sounds like a mosquito trying to jump around from arm to arm to fill its daily quota of blood sucking for the day. Let Wazo send your eardrums to the electric chair with this killer, unforgettable track. Next up is a track titled Lamb's Anger, like the album, which is another interlude track of sorts, just a bunch of rickety noises. We get it, Wazo, you're weird and wacky and, and your music sounds all broken, but I love you, you son of a bitch, you could do whatever you want. Error Gene, featuring Error Smith, is this psycho computer gone haywire with another kick snare behind it. Another track I kind of find myself skipping over, but like Bruce Willis is Dead was for me at one point, maybe I'll eventually find myself digging this song more in the future. All of the songs that have features on this album, I personally find to be the weaker points of the album. I think if Wazo kept it completely featureless, the album would ironically tie itself together in a better fashion. It wouldn't have these rare moments of, personally for me, duds. This is the case for the next song as well, Steroids featuring Ed Banger's very own Ufi, Uffy? I don't know, I think it's Ufi? Um, which just seems really empty and hollow, like the It Takes Two song earlier in the album. It's another weak, flat instrumental with a cheesy rap on top of it, in my opinion that maybe needs some more tuning or extra layering. Another case Wazo should have just figured out for me. However, there is a remix that he's done for this track which I think is way better and brings him more to life and I think it would have fit better on this album. Anything that Wazo has with organic lyrics on Lamb's Anger, I personally find to be unnecessary and strays away from that inhuman-like flow this album does so well in the first place. Unless if it's repeated vocal samples like Bruce Willis is Dead and the positive one, which inevitably just adds more weird charm to the already weird tracks. But then next, oh baby, another friggin' gem. Track number 13, Gay Dentist, is absolutely amazing, sparking anyone to get up out of their chairs and dance. It's another one of those predictably unpredictable songs. There is this insane change-up on the drop in this song that just blows the roof off of this thing. It's meaty and action-packed with a multitude of drum tracks behind it, a jarring stutter chop solo in the middle of it, just a really fun adventure, all stuffed into 3 minutes and 38 seconds. And you tell me that drop towards the end isn't vicious. It's like this killer car wash where all the spinning machinery cleaning your car has pointy teeth on them, and they all have googly eyes and are dancing to a beat. Listen, Everything dances, no matter what. If it's a mosquito or a grandfather clock, oh, this is Lamb's Anger. This is some crazy shit. And we are not done yet, because the next track, Porcher 7, which is a recycling of Porcher 2 in the beginning of the track list, will send your ass to another dimension. This thing is a banger. Patch Headington, certified grade A banger. Every individual sound on this song is so prominent and loud. Wazo sent an army of instrumentals banging on pots and pans to wake up everyone in the neighborhood. And it all drops down to a half a beat of what it was at the end of the track, and those empty spaces each hit 
between the kick and the snare and that empty little space, it's a great way to exit your ears out from this track. You may feel a bit woozy, but that's that Wazo baby. That's that Wazo recipe. My man is taking you for a ride, and it's not like Six Flags or something. He ain't checking if you're strapped in, so you just better grab on and, and just hope for the best. After this, we get a track simply titled W, which is a reuse of the track Z from earlier on the album. It's rolled out like dough, though, and is constructed to be an almost sluggish form of what we heard earlier on the album, and this I actually find to be a perfect fit as a track to follow up Portraiture 7, because it really feels like the album is winding down and catching its breath as we approach the end of the track list and after such a massive, head-rocking song like Portraiture 7. It's quirky but brooding, and I find this track to be my favorite interlude of sorts on the album, or at least one that seems to make the most sense. Lars von Sen comes on right after, it's another interlude track. Honestly, really quick, this album feels like 14 tracks, you know, long, without the four interlude tracks. I'll count the W track as an actual song, but Lars von Sen, Lamb's Anger, and Rank are pretty much filler noise things, so. The track sounds like an airplane taking off with some lady speaking French over it. Not too much to be seen here. And finally, our last track on Lamb's Anger, Blind Concerto or Concerto. This track is similar to Error Gene, in which it sounds like you made this computer mad or something, and it's come to life right in front of you. But it also has that, you know, mere kick snare beat behind it, which at this point you may become sick of <laughs> towards the end of the album. Almost every song on here has that same beat. It does have some fun time changes in the track, but it's another song I find myself not really visiting unless I'm doing a complete playthrough of the album from start to finish. Personally, I would have loved if he switched Blind Concerto and Portrait 7 on the track list. Uh, just so we can truly send off Lamb's Anger with a bang. But that's some real nitpicking for me, so I'm just gonna chill. So that's the track list and my song-to-song -song breakdown of it. And you may be asking yourself, Ped, Ped Chennington, you claim this is your favorite album of all time, yet you're giving, you know, some songs on here pretty heavy shit. Meanwhile, you always seem to love everything you talk about on the channel. So what gives? I find the obvious imperfections of Lamb's Anger to be so unbelievably charming even the tracks I don't get too much joy out of. There is this texture baked into every track that is one of the true mechanisms in the end, wiring the chaos all together as one cohesive piece. Every track is fuzzy, spiky, or harsh, or warm. Lamb's Anger is a rubber band ball begging to come apart and has a distinct overall sound that will really make me always say, this is Mr. Wazo. And when it comes to the tracks I like on here, listen, I really, really, really love them. They are some of my favorite songs ever. Cut Dick, Poor Richer 7, Positive, Z, Bruce Willis is Dead, Gay Dentist, Undeniable, Lethal Killers every time I put them on. And I put these tracks on such a pedestal that a high handful of these tracks alone rise Lamb's Anger up to be a champ of an album. Lamb's Anger is a little league baseball team with half the kids being absolute superstars, while the other half are kids who don't even want to be there and are just forced by unfulfilled dads trying to live their lives through their kids athletically. It would make for the perfect 90s coming-of-age Disney film, and it's a film, goddammit, I will watch countless times and never ever get sick of. I root for the flashy home run hitters on here, and I also root for the not-so-talented ones. I just love the entire team that is Lamb's Anger. Context, though, is what holds these tracks together as an album. Without the 74 seconds of buzzing and clicking noises that make up title track Lamb's Anger, the funky beats of Cut Dick, or the summery beauty of Joe would pale significantly. It's this perfect balance of pace and style that makes the tuneless bits acceptable. Lamb's Anger is my favorite album of all time. I've put so much time into this album, and I highly recommend you give it a chance if you haven't heard it yet. Let me know what you think of it, as well as what your favorite album of all time is, in the comments below. I also invite you to check out my Patreon page with awesome rewards and exclusive benefits for those who become a Pad Chennington patron. My dream is to be able to do all of this full time, and I can't thank everyone enough who has supported me along the way on this journey, even if you're just a casual viewer of the channel, or if this is your first time even being here, thank you so much for listening to what I gotta say. Anyway, I love you so much, thank you for spending some time with me. Much love, your boy, and go listen to Lamb's Anger. I love you, Mr. Wazo, Pad Chennington.